Hey, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala rabbi shahi sadri wa yasilli amri wa ahlal uqdatim min lisani yafqahu qawli Assalamu alaikum everyone, I hope you're all safe and well inshallah Welcome, welcome, welcome to the official launch of Bima Students aka SBIMA My name is Zed and I am the campaigns and training officer for this year and I will be your host for this evening inshallah uh, just before we get started, on behalf of the team, I'd just like to apologize that we had to slightly delay the event. We just ran into some unforeseen circumstances. Uh, we've got an amazing event lined up for you today, inshallah. But before we properly dive in, let us start off with the best of words. So please could I invite Brother Fahim to join us for the recitation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا وجعل فيها سراجا وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة لمن أراد لمن أراد أن يذكر أو أراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما والذين يقولون ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساءت مستقرا ومقاما والذين إذا أنفقوا لم يسرفوا ولم يقتروا لم يسرفوا ولم يقتروا وكان بين ذلك قواما والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك يلقى أثاما يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما وَمَنْ تَابَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابًا وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورَ وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُوا عَلَيْهَا لم يخروا عليها صما وعميانا والذين يقولون ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما أولئك يجزون الغرفة بما صبروا ويلقون فيها تحية وسلاما خالدين فيها حسنت مستقرا ومقاما 
قل ما يعبأ بكم ربي لولا دعاءكم فقد كذبتم فسوف يكون لزاما صدق الله العلي العظيم ما شاء الله جزاك الله خير for that beautiful recitation فهيم سبحان الله very powerful verses there from the end of سورة الفرقان describing the qualities of Ibad al-Rahman. Okay, so moving forward. So just uh, before we get started, if you guys are not already aware, this is part one of a two-part series for the SBIMA launch program. Today's main focus will be talking about what SBIMA is and what we hope to get up to. And part two will be taking place this Saturday at 5 p.m. inshallah and is titled Coping During COVID. And inshallah, you'll hear more about that later on. Uh, so just as a summary for what we have in store for you today, after I've uh, finished speaking, uh, we'll have Sister Mahbuba talking about uh, what is SBIMA. We'll then have a talk by Dr. Wajid, uh, talking us through a bit of the vision behind SBIMA and what we hope to achieve. And then uh, if, we, if we have a bit of time, we will have a short break before reconvening to hear some of the amazing projects we have in store for you guys. Uh, just some housekeeping rules before we get started. Uh, some of you guys may not be familiar with using Zoom webinars as this is uh, unlike using Zoom calls. If you guys have any questions at any stage, please just uh, send them in the Q&A section and inshallah someone from the team will answer that for you. And I know you guys are all probably sick and tired of all these virtual uh, like teaching and like teaching sessions and talks, but uh, just be assured that inshallah this is going to be a great way to spend your Thursday evening and inshallah, you'll leave today with a clear understanding of what SBIMA is. And inshallah, you'll feel inspired uh, and ready to embark on this journey uh, along with us. Uh, but just before I hand it over to uh, Sister Mahbuba to talk about what SBIMA is, I thought it would just be nice to actually give you a bit of context behind SBIMA and where the idea of it all came about from. Uh, so Dr. Shams, who is the... Uh, the founder and the pioneer behind uh, SBIMA. He is unfortunately unable to join us tonight. Uh, so you guys are going to be stuck with my version of events. Uh, oh, can we just go back? We don't need to bubble yet. <laughs> uh, so you're going to be stuck with my version of events, unfortunately. Uh, so for those who don't know me, uh, uh, I'm Zed and I study at BSMS, which is Brighton Sussex Medical School. I'm currently in my fifth year. And because I'm at BSMS, it means I'm technically a part of both the University of Brighton and the University of Sussex. So honestly, what feels like a lifetime ago now, back in 2015, I joined BSMS as a fresher. And within a week or so, I met some of the Muslim students uh, from the medical school in higher years. And honestly, I was just shocked at what they told me when they were telling me how the, exper the experience for Muslim medical students at the uni was just horrific. And honestly, I was just in shock. The reason for this is, as I alluded to earlier, BSMS means we are uh, part of both the University of Brighton and the University of Sussex. And just as is the case with most medical school and more so for ours, it meant that our med school almost functioned as its own separate institution. So it's very difficult for any uh, medical students or members to actually engage with any University of Brighton uh, societies events or any University of Sussex uh, societies or events and that includes the Islamic societies. So, uh, and BSMS itself had its own separate MedSoc, which functioned as its own like mini SU. And it meant that it was just very difficult to engage with the, the broader like uh, student experience. This is due to multiple reasons, uh, primarily just because of geographical location, but also because uh, med students have their own separate like uh, timetable and term dates, uh, which just uh, didn't seem to fit in with what the most medical, uh, what, what most university students have gone through. As a result, it meant that uh, what I like to define as the medic bubble uh, existed and medics often get stuck in this bubble where we just were trapped in it and we're unable to engage fully with, uh, uh, with other like societies and events and have the same experience which other university students have. Uh, this would be okay if this bubble was very inclusive and welcoming for Muslim students. However, 
Um, this is often not the case. And uh, often within the bubble, it can be quite disengaging and, and hard for Muslims to fit in. Yep, so if you can click, please. So uh, most medical schools have their own med socks. And as I alluded to, they often fail to cater for uh, most Muslim students. And this is, again, due to a number of reasons, but I'm sure you guys are all well aware that there's a heavy drinking and like uh, culture within medical schools, uh, not just for social events, but even just sports or academia. It all seems to have, uh, in, like revolve heavily around alcohol. So it, it meant that uh, our med school, for example, or our, ex our, our medical school, it was just almost hostile for Muslims as it was just very unwelcoming and uninviting. It was just hard for us to fit in. So we, would, we were trapped in this medic bubble, unable to escape and interact with the existing Islamic societies. And within the bubble, we just felt uh, very alone and very, I don't know, uh, just as a minority, essentially. So we came up with a solution, like Alhamdulillah, and we got our society for the medical school. And uh, SubhanAllah, it just gave us an amazing platform to just unite together and to essentially give us a voice uh, before when we were just, uh, as opposed to before when we were just voiceless. And like, despite the fact that we only had around 20 members and it wasn't a very large ISOC, Alhamdulillah, we were all very tight and close knit. And again, it just, it, just the community feeling was just, uh, it just it drastically improved the Muslim experience. So if we fast, fast forwarding on, a few years, oh no, we could stay back, stay back, please. So fast forwarding on a few years, uh, it's 2018 and I was intercalating in Bristol. This is where I met Brother Shams, uh, who at the time was setting up the Society Muslim Medics Bristol. And honestly, I was shocked at what he was telling me uh, in the fact that he was, his experience as a Muslim medical student in Bristol almost mirrored what like the previous experience of Muslim students at uh, BASMS was like in the fact that it was just very difficult uh, it was just a very difficult experience for Muslim students at, in the Bristol Medical School and again this was due to the fact that uh, Bristol, uh, Bristol medical students were again stuck in the medic bubble and again there was this alcohol uh, culture and there was this uninviting uninclusive culture and it just um, peer pressure and just uh, various factors such as that and also the uh, people who were in the higher years, in the clinical years, were just geographically dispersed all over the place and the term dates were different. So it meant that they couldn't fully engage with the Is Islamic society and hence Muslim Medics Bristol was created. And like Alhamdulillah, it was an instant success and it gave the platform to just like have so many amazing events, uh, which just were not possible before. So just for example, academic events such as OSCE teaching sessions or just exam preparation, socials, widening participation events to increase the uptake of Muslim uh, college and uh, sixth form students into a uh, career such as uh, medicine. And also just like teaching CPR in the local community, for example. And again, this uh, the Muslim Med Bristol, it did not uh, replace or rival the ISOC at the time. It just like it, it coexisted alongside it and helped and they both complemented one another. So I think it was just about just over a year ago, Shams and I were having a discussion and I, we were just reflecting on, I don't know, the success of BSMS ISOC and Muslim Medics Bristol and how much a difference it had made in just like increasing morale and just uniting together the Muslim students within each medical school. And we just, we had the idea that subhanAllah, we need to just, find a way of replicating this and scaling this up because there's just so many other healthcare courses and just so many other institutions across the UK where they don't have this like amazing support network where they don't have this community and the healthcare students in these places I, I do just feel alone they're subject to peer pressure they may lack academic support they may even face discrimination and have this like lack of inclusivity so we thought, subhanAllah, we need to we need to do something about this and create an organization. And that's where this came from. But just having said that, as in uh, like BSMS ISOC and Muslim Medics Bristol are by no means like pioneers. 
in this regard there's like other existing muslim medical societies uh, which i'm sure you guys are all aware of such as imed in birmingham or muslim medics in imperial but despite all of these like amazing muslim medic societies all across the uk doing amazing things and our members having such shared experiences and the individual societies having such shared aims and objectives there's just such little dialogue and collaboration and unity between them so we had we were very firm upon the idea that we didn't we didn't want to just strengthen the communities locally in each area we wanted to ensure everyone was working together and was united uh, under one umbrella organization and we wanted this initiative and project to be sustainable and to have a lot of manpower and resources behind it so it made sense to do it as a sub branch of bema and I know some of you guys may be thinking, oh, subhanAllah, what's, what's this guy on about? He's talking about a Muslim student umbrella organization. Don't we already have CW and FOSIS for that? Why do we need another one of these? So I just I just want to make it clear from the get-go, SBM is not replacing or existing, uh, not replacing or rivaling existing Muslim organizations such as FOSIS or CW. All three are working towards the same goal and actually complement uh, one another. We just have our own specific focuses and niches. And SBIMA just aims to uh, essentially just target the, the gaps and fill in the gaps which are not being met. Essentially, all, all three uh, want to unite together Muslim students and ensure that a spiritual, social, academic and pastoral needs are all being met. So essentially, that's just a bit of background from where the idea of SBIMA actually came about from. I hope you guys found that useful. I just wanted uh, to be transparent with you guys so you all so you all understand properly where where this has all come from. Uh, but just to, to tell you more about the actual specifics and details of SBIMA, I'll now hand over to Sister Mahbuba, who is the National Vice Director for SBIMA. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah everyone. I hope you're all well, um, in the best of health and in mind, inshallah, and you're enjoying the launch so far. My name is Wafiba, I'm a third year medical student at Brighton and Sussex and um, yeah, vice director for SBIMA this year. Um, I'm generally very happy to see so many of you guys have joined. SubhanAllah that you're giving up your Thursday evenings and also a big thank you for the patience in bearing with our delays. But we've got here, alhamdulillah, and I cannot praise enough the amazing team behind the incredible efforts. So to get into the presentation and answer the question that you've all joined for, what exactly is SBIMA? So BIMA Students is the first national body to voice and foster the views of Muslim healthcare students. We are a team within the British Islamic Medical Association and we share that same vision with them of unite, inspire and serve. And to work towards our collective vision, SBIMA involves bringing, building a strong national HCP network. So it's important to note that we want to be inclusive of everyone, not just medics, so every healthcare professional. So our ultimate aim is to help, is to help guide the journey of Muslim healthcare students to navigate their careers with Ihsan and aim for success in the hereafter. And our work is targeted towards the unique experience of healthcare students with a strong recognition of our core identity of what it means to be Muslim in it. So we want to move away from the dichotomy in our identities as HCPs and Muslims. Like Islam is our core principle and it's the answer to everything, including our careers. And our aim is to bring it back to that. We shouldn't be thinking of them as two separate identities when they're one. So, um, sorry, we're on the slide before still. <laughs> okay. However, our vision is what makes any of this possible. So none of what I've mentioned in the slide before would be possible if we didn't consider our vision first and foremost. And a vision forms the basis of a strong team. So on the next slide, I'll introduce who we have in our team. So we've put together two infographics to explain. So to begin with, we've got a core team, 
So Shams is our national director. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it tonight. He sends his apologies and inshallah, you'll see him at future events. And you've heard from Zaid, he's our campaigns and training officer. He's from BSMS. Humaid is our communications officer and he's working behind the webinar today, making sure it runs smoothly. And he's from BSMS as well. Um, it's starting to sound like BSMS have sponsored us. They haven't, but yeah. Um, Shaseb is our mentorship officer from Southampton. Kuzema is our national allied healthcare advocate for dentistry from Bristol. Mahnoor is another national allied healthcare advocate for optometry from Huddersfield. Mahwesh, you'll hear from her later on, and she's our education officer from Swansea. Zainab is our marketing officer from Leeds. Mariam is our widening participation officer from Birmingham. Faisal is our research and policy officer from KCL. And Hamza is our partnerships officer from Nottingham. Finally, we have Sahifa, who is UK Regions Coordinator from Nottingham as well. And she helps coordinate the big national team of medical student ambassadors that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. The ambassador role involves representing their institution. So as you can see, you can spot your institution as well, inshallah. And their role is directly gathering ideas, feedbacks and concerns to inform us in each stage of project development. So we'll be continually going through with them throughout the year at each stage to ensure that everyone's views are represented in our national projects in Sharma. And Alhamdulillah, together we represent 21 medical schools and subhanAllah, there is strength and unity, though it's important to highlight that our work is not limited to medics, but as it's our first year, we want we wanted it to begin on a sustainable footing before branching out in Sharma. But to re reiterate, SBMO is open to all healthcare professionals. So what can um, SBMO offer? So unity and national belonging was already touched upon by Zaid. So I'll move on to access to BMO contacts and support. Essentially, we're all sitting here as students now, and many of us have a support system through our ISOCs and Muslim medical societies. But where we all fall short on is who do we look beyond the wise older years? And who do we look when, to when we ultimately graduate? And we've created that gap because we haven't accounted for what happens afterwards. Though SBIMA can bridge that gap with BIMA. And it's about acknowledging the transition between going from a student to a healthcare professional. By SBIMA working as a team within BIMA, we've recognised that the rest of BIMA has a lot to give and share with the next generation. And we're excited to see the great potential. So our very involvement now within SBIMA will shape the image of BIMA as we transition into our careers, inshallah. And then we've got tailored support for your institution. We've recognised that the national picture isn't the same for everyone. Each society, each ISOC is unique. And some Muslim medical societies have been able to thrive whilst others are still starting out. But each is unique and what you can offer to one another is, has great potential, inshallah. And then as seen in the maps, we've got an incredible platform of where we can bring all these people together along with their expertise, their reflections and their advice. And it's narrated in a beautiful hadith that truly the believers are like, are one to another, like components of a building and each part supports the other. So then we have um, national campaigns and advocacy. Um, we're committed to advocating on issues and challenges that Muslim healthcare students face through their studies, placement and progression. Faisal, our research um, officer, she's already made a brilliant start, mashallah, with research, and you'll be hearing more from us along the way and how we plan to actually take a proactive stance together and represent our national views. Um, mentorship, this is in the development to ensure a quality-driven programme that is effective and taps into the great people already within BIMA, inshallah. And lastly, um, most importantly, is what SBIMA can offer is by no means exhaustive of what I've mentioned. At one point, I was literally listing things, but it isn't, it, um, it's not limited, specialising everyone that's joined today, everyone that, that will 
join our projects and unity is key and it involves effort from every individual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran and hold firmly to the hope of Allah altogether and do not become divided. Wisdom, dedication and collaborative effort from us all together will be what SBIMA can truly offer. So lastly, I hope I've shared some enthusiasm for SBIMA and at this point, I'm really hoping your question is, how do I get involved? Have we moved on? Yeah. Firstly, um, we would massively recommend that you join as a BEMA member. So this isn't completely necessary, but it takes two minutes and it keeps you up to date on not only the exciting projects within Student BEMA, but the rest of the wider organisation as well. So if you've got your phone to hand, scan it now and inshallah, like it'll be a good start. And then secondly, speak to your MSA and student BEMA ambassadors at each of the project development stages of any project we run. We ask them to be representatives of their ISOCs and MMs. So they'll collate, identify and feedback thoughts. So please utilize this link. If you're not aware of this link within your own ISOC or MM, I would massively encourage you to get in contact with them and ask them to form a link with SBIMA, inshallah. And then next to follow is um, to follow British IMA on Instagram. So that will be our main platform for advertising events and updates. And we'll be regularly posting. I'm sure some of you guys may have seen our last marketing strategy. And yeah, we're consistent with it and it will all be there, on sh there to share, inshallah. And also your, your medical student ambassadors and SBIMA roles, they'll be out there advertising as well. And then this directly places me to my two final requests of everyone that has attended tonight. If, so firstly, if any of this presentation has resonated with anyone or whoever will be speaking today or later on, please share, like, let others know and share the barakah in this project. And lastly, and most importantly, keep this project in your du'as. As mentioned earlier, we are the first of it in its kind, but we shouldn't allow that to become a fun fact that basically passes with time. We're, we're not guaranteed an instantaneous success by any means. And like, alhamdulillah, we have set our great ambitions and changes we'd like to drive, but ultimately our success lies through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to end with, may he, may he grant us the change we would like to see in ourselves first and foremost, reward our efforts and unify our hearts closer to him. I mean, Jazakallah Khair for listening to me. I mean, I mean, Jazakallah Khair for that Mahbuba. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm certainly super excited to see our projects slowly start turning themselves into reality. And the next section, is an exciting section because we're going to properly hone in on why we are doing all of this and is it is by a speaker who you're probably all very familiar with and needs no introduction uh, you may all be familiar with uh, dr wajid for his various talks and articles on islamic history or his role in creating cw however by trade dr wajid is actually a gp and is the current uh, vice director of bima so inshallah i'll hand over to dr wajid now Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan for the uh, introduction. Uh, can you guys uh, see me and hear me? Yes, we can see and hear you. Jazakallah khairan. Alhamdulillah wa alameen wa salatu wa salamu wa shirukul anbiya wa muslimin nabiyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam wa ilahi tasliman jami'an kathira. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about probably the most important question that every one of you should be asking, which is why are you here? Why are you in this webinar? Why are you interested? There are so many other things that you could be doing. There's a pandemic on. You probably are quite busy with, at, uh, at uni or at work. And even if you're not busy, then there's like a million other things to watch on Netflix that are far more interesting and exciting than what's going on here right now. You could be speaking to a friend, you could be watching another YouTube video. There's a hundred things that you could do that isn't sitting on yet another Zoom call, listening to someone talk. So why are you here? What is it about SBIMA that is worthy of the one thing that you will never, ever get back? 
the one thing that you can never return to you. If you gave us money, I might be able to give you that money back. But you're giving time, I will never be able to give that back to you. So you're here and either you're one of the core team who've already given their time or you're someone who's thinking, should I give my time to this? What is this all about? And that's what I'm going to try to explain to you what SBMA could be all about. Because right now, you've already heard um, what, it's, what SBMA, you know, their vision behind it, why, it's, why it was created, what was the need for it to be created, and what the structure and stuff looks like. But I want to talk about the future. So before we can talk about the future, we've got to talk about the past. You know, every one of you knows this because... As a Muslim healthcare student or healthcare professional, we keep going back to the same few people. We keep talking about Ibn Sina, keep talking about Ibn Nafis, we keep talking about, well, actually, we don't talk about Ibn Nafis. We only talk about Ibn Sina because that's one of the few people that we know. And we keep going back to this golden age. We have this idea. We're aware, even if you're not a really, even if you're not a practicing Muslim. Even if you aren't really interested in history, every one of us is aware that our history was pretty cool. It was golden. I don't know what it was. I don't know what actually happened. I don't know who was there apart from Messina, but I know our history was pretty cool. I know that we did a lot of stuff. What stuff? Don't ask me what we actually did. Don't ask me what, you know, how we did it. But I know that there was some stuff that happened and it was golden. It was amazing. We were amazing. Mm -hmm. That's all. But you also know that right now we're not so golden. We're not so cool. We have real problems. We have real issues. As, as we were you know, uh, being told earlier that every time someone gets into med school or pharmacy or nursing, you are shocked by the level of, I don't want to say always Islamophobia, but sometimes how not conducive it is to a Muslim atmosphere. How you feel left out. How you feel like socializing revolves around alcohol. And therefore you're almost forced into a clique. How even at a university, the medical school is always separated from the rest of, the rest of the students. So if you're at a university, any university, let's, let's take Queen Mary's in London. If you're at Queen Mary's, if you study anything at Queen Mary's, if you study engineering, if you study arts, if you study computer science, if you study philosophy, it doesn't matter. You are at Queen Mary's. But one subject, medicine, if you study it, you're separated off to Bart's. So you're already separated from everyone else and you you're kind of isolated and yeah you might have a good time there but you still feel there are lots and lots of problems so the difference between where we were and where we are is huge you know when you when they teach you about any diseases i can guarantee you that you will go through five years six years of med school and you will not hear one single muslim name ever mentioned as someone who discovered a disease or a cure or anything. Everything is, you know, um, you know, the Arnold Chiari malformation or Prader Willi disease or whatever. It just looks like we didn't exist. It's like history started 300 years ago in Renaissance Europe and that was it. You know, we were all cavemen. So it can be disconcerting. But what happened? Why are we here right now? And what can we do about it? So that's what I'm going to talk to you about first. How can we go back from where we are right now to where we want to be? Rebuild this golden age that we know is possible. Number one, you need a vision. You need to have a vision. Why do I say that? Because you could say, well, we know we need money or we need uh, like a good organization or we need to have people in the top levels of, of research, or we need to this, we need to that. Why do I say we need a vision first? 
Why is always vision first? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, are the blind equal to those who see? Are the blind equal to those who see? He's asking us a rhetorical question. Of course they're not equal. But what is it that's different about those who are blind? They can't see, right? They lack vision. They lack a vision. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not asking necessarily about physical blindness. He's not saying, are blind people equal to those who can, who, who can, who can walk around? with? No, he's not asking that. Because people who lack a vision, people who lack a vision of where they want to go, what they want to achieve, what they want to do, these people are blind. For all intents and purposes, you might be able to see out of your eyes. But if you have no idea what you're doing, if you have no idea what your plans are, what you hope to do in five years' time, 10 years' time, 50 years' time, then you might as well be blind because you're going to be led around by other people. This friend says, you know what, you should do X, they'll, you'll end up doing X. They say, do Y, you'll do Y. This application comes in front of you, you'll do that application. You haven't got a plan, you haven't got a clue, you haven't got a hope. So no, the blind are not equal to those who see. They're very different. You need a vision because vision is what people aim for. It's what organizations can be built on. It's what Islam was built on. Think about it. Five pillars in Islam. What's pillar number one? Not, why isn't pillar number one praying? Surely without uh, uh, prayer, you can't, you can't, you're not doing ibadah, then you know, how are you a Muslim? What about zakat? What about, what about Ramadan? What about hajj? What pillar number one is the vision? La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That's pillar number one. First thing that you need to learn. Everything else comes second. Aisha radiallahu anha taught us this. She said words to the effect that had it not been that in the 13 years at Mecca that the Prophet had taught us to believe in Allah, to desire a Jannah, and to fear hell. He had drilled in the vision for those 13 years. Then, when in Medina, they were asked to pray, or to give zakat, or to go hajj, they would not have done it. They would not have done it. If you went to someone, and this is our problem, you know, this is da'wah problem as well. When you go to someone, the first thing we tell people, you know, we talk about hijab to non-Muslims. So what? If a non-Muslim wears a hijab, will she become Muslim? No. There'll be a non-Muslim wearing hijab. We talk to them about, you know, this and that, and all the, all the side issues. We don't talk about them. The number one issue is what? Tawheed. That's the number one thing. Vision first. If you have a strong vision, if you, ha if you have no vision, you have no hope. If you have a vision, then you can make anything happen. Ask yourself. Just ask yourself realistically how is it possible that there are some teams and some organizations which you cannot get anyone to do anything you all know this right every one of these university you are uh, you have seen isox you know how it functions right you can't convince anyone to do anything you beg them you ask them your friend please do this do that they will not do anything They'll come, they're like, I'm here, oh, man, I'm busy, I'm tired, I'm sick. 101 excuses. But for other things, they're there, they're ready. They're sweating away. Why is it? Why is it in another organization, in another team, someone's rolling up their sleeves and they're working and they're working hard. They're doing two o'clock in the morning. They don't care. They come back from work and they're straight into a webinar. No problem. But in another one, they can't be tossed. Why? It's vision. You, one if someone believes in the vision, they'll do anything to make it work. Right? That's why some Muslims are being tortured to death, are being put into concentration camps, are having their organs harvested, are being murdered and watching their kids be killed and starved to death, and they stick with Islam. And that's why us sitting here in the West, having everything that we want, our, our iman is shaky. Up and down. I don't know, man. I don't know. 
because they believe. And we, I don't know what we do. Vision, number one. If you, we need a vision. So, number two. You agree with me, we need a vision, inshallah. That's the number one thing. Everything comes second. If you don't have a vision, by the way, remember, we all need the same vision as well. Because if you don't have that, then we're going to split up within days, not even years. You, are you, do you think you're the first people who think of, of this idea as Bima? Do you think you're the first guys? Come on, guys. We've seen, this is like the Matrix. I've seen versions of you guys way before. So learn from them why they failed. And do you think we're the first guys who tried to bring Muslim healthcare professionals together? No way. They have, these things have existed forever. But this was the missing ingredient. So what should the vision be? You need the right vision. Before we do that, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Uh, this is going to be interactive. And I, I promise I'm not going to be taking much longer. I think we can be interactive. Can you guys, can, can you guys message in the panelist thing or the question section? I don't know where, which section you can message in. Can, what are the problems that, the, that we can have that Muslim healthcare students are facing? What are the problems that we should be solving, that need solving, that you can think of? Okay. I'm going to open this up a little bit. Um, where is it? There it is. Can anyone tell me what problems and uh, what, what, what problems do we think that we need to be sharing or we need to be working on? I can't, I can't see the thingy. If, is, is, can someone read out the, any comments? What problems do you think we need solving as Muslim healthcare students? Bum, bum, bum. I need to be able to see your, your, your comments, guys. There we go. That's, that's where it is. Oh, that keeps disappearing. Uh, Zaid Mahbuba, can you read out what the comments are? Yes, I'll read, I'll read them out now, inshallah. Okay. Um, lack of representation as father? Yeah, lack of representation. There's harassment in the workplace. Yeah. Don't judge my spelling. <laughs> Increased engagement with university events. Okay. Lack of unity. Yep. Lack of dialogue between Muslim students and the wider student body. Yep. Helping each other instead of competing. Yep. The absence of sincere intention. Yep. Getting involved as leaders, shapers, and directors. Yep. Mentorship. Um, Islamophobia. Identity crisis. Big one. Future career opportunities. Toxic competitiveness. Oh yeah, med school. One times. Closeness to Dean. Increased awareness of basic Islamic knowledge as it can affect patient care. E.g. Yep. beliefs around psychiatry and end of life care. Oh, uh, yeah, Islamic ethics. Uh, feeling alone. Yeah. Lonely, mental health issues. Yeah. Maintaining intentions. Yeah, I'll put that under Islamic knowledge or sincerity, intentions. Let's think, think bigger. What else do we want? We want to get in, we want to help other people get into healthcare, right? So helping students, uh, helping uh, young uh, Muslim students um, get into uni. What about looking after the healthcare of our, our community? Healthcare of our community. What about mental health, mental health uh, taboos? What about, um, so, you know, uh, what about encouraging, uh, what about dealing with uh, issues like uh, Ramadan and Eid uh, breaks during uni? What about catching Jummah prayer, Jummah prayer and lectures? 
What about uh, having more Islamic history in the syllabus, right? Like being like uh, celebrating Islamic, um, Islamic medical history in the syllabus. Come on guys, more? There's gotta be, there's, there's, there's tons, there's hundreds of things that we can think about. We've got peer pressure, we've got arrogance, realigning our values and manners. Yeah, but you guys, that, that's a lot of stuff that I would put under like Islamic mm -hmm. adab, sincerity, and intentions. And, you know, I, I know we're all from the ISO crowd, so or most of us anyway. So that's where we go to. But think bigger. Think, think wider. How about helping Muslims get into research? Uh, how about um, helping with um, um, uh, families, right? So sisters like uh, getting who who might be uh, getting married or have children. So more graduates getting into medicine as well. So helping uh, Muslim moms, grads. How about? Um, Let's have a look. We've got prayer facilities. Prayer facilities. We've, we've got like uh, some things like hijab and bare below the elbow in the theater. Yep. There, there, the, the amount of stuff. What about coordinating with the other Muslim students across the world? With other countries? What about um, uh, helping Muslims write papers so that we can get you know better CVs, building better CVs? What about encouraging, um, uh, because we're probably the most organized group on campus, what about encouraging people in engineering, encouraging other disciplines? We want, if there's an SBIMA, where's the uh, engineering version of this? Where's the teaching version of this? Who's going to do that? If it's not you guys, nobody else is, right? What about working on um, like uh, issues like um, helping with, uh, you know, when you go on placements, you have to stay away or dorms. Um, so housing facilities for students. So you can help maybe like, you know, the, if a sister's going, then she can, uh, there'll be three other sisters that make, they can house share, things like that. I mean, the list is endless. When you start going into what we could possibly be working on, you know, honestly, we would fill this, I'd, and, and it might even get a little bit boring, but we could fill this up multiple times over with the things that are needed to be done for Muslim healthcare students. And each one of these, if they were to be done, it would help, you know, make things so different. If you have that one Muslim medical tutor, if you have... A, even a normal student tutor who's like, you know what, go take a, 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 a we're not going to arrange any lectures at, at, at Friday prayer time. It makes you feel valued. If you are able to help other in, underprivileged kids get into, you know, with interview practice, helping with, inter, you know, it, um, because there's so many of them who are like, I don't know how to get into med school, or they've got the grades, but they failed the interview. It happens to so many Muslim students. It's unbelievable. So, any one of these areas, if we focused on, we would make a humongous difference. We'd make lasting difference and we'd change lives, inshallah. And we would upskill our community. But the problem mm -hmm. is, who's gonna, ma who's gonna work on this? If, if you, one of you was to work on this area, then nobody would be there to help you. You would just end up doing it. I'll, I'll tell you a true story. One brother came up to me, um, this is about 10, 15 years ago. He came up to me and he saw, um, uh, a video by the Anthony Nolan Trust. Have you guys heard of the Anthony Nolan Trust? Anthony Nolan Trust was set up for um, ethnic minorities to do with bone marrow transplant because um, they, unfortunately, ethnic minorities do not donate uh, bone marrow um, to the register. And therefore, when people from ethnic minorities are desperate for bone marrow transplants, they're unable to get matches and quite often they die at a higher rate than people from uh, a white background. So he saw this video, he, he you know, he was plugged in. He's, uh, he saw a video of this 
poor Muslim child who unfortunately died because there just wasn't enough. And he came to me and he goes, Wajid, we've got to do this. We have got to do this. I mean, it is a life or death matter. We have to encourage people to donate bone marrow. And I said, you're right, we need to do it, but we're not going to do it. And he was like, no, no, I'm going to do it. I was like, no, don't do this. And he's like, how could you be so heartless to tell me not to do it? I said, because there's 101 other things to do, my friend. There's literally 101 other things to do as well. And if you do this, you make the same mistake that every single other person who's got like a good intention does. You will do it and I will tell you what will happen. You'll be the only one doing it because you're the only one who believes in it. Nobody else believes in it. So you're working hard. You will work, work, work. You'll convince your friend and a few other people to do it. And the minute you get tired, the minute you get bored, the minute you, you, you graduate or you get married or you die, it will stop. It will finish. Guaranteed it will finish. Because nobody else believes in it like you believed in it. It will all fall apart. Just like a thousand other projects before it have fallen apart and the next thousand after it will fall apart. It will disappear. If you believe in this, I ask you not to work on Anthony Nolan Trust, not to work on this issue. I ask you to unify everyone. Build the system. Build the mothership. When you do that, then what will happen is that you're creating a system which creates projects. One of the projects of this system will be bone marrow transplant, inshallah. You may never even be directly involved, but one of the projects will be the bone marrow transplant thing, and it will continue and it will survive, inshallah, because it is part of a sustainable, holistic system. Now, and I said very clear, I said, if you're going for the glory, then go and do your project and watch how it will disappear. But if you want it to succeed, then don't work on your project. Work on unifying, and your project will happen, inshallah. He went for the glory. It didn't happen. You guys, no, nothing's happening with that. But I ask you guys, don't go for the glory. Go for the one thing that will make every one of these things happen. Maybe not this year, not next year, but eventually, inshallah. Go for the one thing that will make all of these things happen. And that is unity. That's what the vision of Bhima is. The vision of Bhima is very simple. It is unity. And that the reason for that is because we, re, we, we sat down and we thought about it for a long time. That unless we unite, no matter what we want to do, we will never achieve it. It will never be sustainable. It will collapse in our own lifetime. And we will find that you might try to get lots of Muslims into, interview, uh, to, to, uh, into the interview panel, but other Muslims will undercut you. Other Muslims will screw you over. Other Muslims will let you down. They will copy your project and they will move uh, and they will, they'll start selling it. For, they'll do it for money. But if you unite together, then inshallah, you have a chance. You have a chance of making a difference. And when you unite, we need to inspire. Who do we inspire? We inspire each other. When you're united, we're, we can become super inspirational. We inspire the world. Listen, guys. When you see a non-Muslim convert, aren't you like really super pumped? Isn't it cool? No matter who you are as a Muslim, when you see a non-Muslim become a Muslim, it is an inspirational moment. Why? Because one person became Muslim. Today, it's because one person became Muslim. In the past... Entire countries would become Muslim. Entire cities and nations would become Muslim. Why? Because we're united. When we're disunited, then literally one by one person at a time will become, and that will be against the grain. That will be going, they'll have to put aside everything they see in the media, everything they know about you and all our reputation. And that, you know, Ahmed's the DJ in the club and Ahmed's is this and, and you know, uh, 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 Aisha's doing that. They have to put aside all that and they still somehow become Muslim. But in the past, when we were united, entire nation would become Muslim. So inspire each other and inspire everyone else and then serve. We're here not just to unite together. We're not just here to unite and sing Kumbaya. We're here to serve. Serve who? Serve each other. Serve the Muslim community and serve the whole UK and the world. There's no limit to who we can serve as long as we're united. So what can go wrong? I'm finishing over here. Look, I'm hoping I sold you on the fact that we need a vision 
And that vision should be unity. If you work for anything other than unity first, then it's, I'm going to tell you, it's going to fail. I can write it down if you want, you know, and I can write it down on a piece of paper. It will fail. If not today, if not tomorrow, day after tomorrow, one day, it will fall. This, I can guarantee you, I, you know, that's one, my one thing that I look at for everything is like, what is the secret ingredient? If you want to know why I go on about unity, 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 of course, you know, Wajid goes on about unity. That's all he talks about. He talks about it in Charity Week. He talks about it in Fosis, And he'll talk about it over here. Yeah, that's because this is the secret ingredient that I've worked out over all these books of reading Islamic history after, after you know, I, I, from my experience is that when you're united, you succeed. And when you're disunited, you will not. Eventually you will fail. So why can't, why does everyone just do it? I'm not, it's not like I'm some kind of super genius. I'm not the first person to come up with this idea. Why don't we all unite? Why isn't it so easy? Simple reason is it's hard to unite. To unite, you guys all have to do something that is really difficult to do. And most of you won't be able to do it. Most of you won't be able to do it. It's to put other people before yourself. Now, it might sound like I'm being arrogant here saying most of you, I'm just going by stats. Most people can't do that. Most ISOCs can't put the needs of the community above their ISOC. Most of them can't. They struggle. It's hard. If it was easy, we would be united. We wouldn't be in the mess we're in right now. Most individuals struggle to put the needs of the community, of the collective above themselves. Mm -hmm. Most campaigns struggle to do it. We still find that. When we have projects like Lifesavers, we have to constantly remind Lifesavers project that sometimes Lifesavers has mm -hmm. to take a hit for the sake of Bima. When we have individuals who are like, I desperately want X, and we're like, sometimes you have to take a back seat for the collective because we only unite when we all sacrifice for the greater good. And that's so hard to put your ego into check, to put your desires into check, to put your needs in check for the sake of everyone else. That is the hardest thing to do. But if you can do it, then the reward is immense. The reward is immense. You want to know what the reward is? This is Bima, brothers and sisters. Bima didn't exist six years ago. Six, seven years ago, Bima did not exist. And in this time, Bima has 4,000 members. Bima is now probably one of the most, if not the most active Islamic Medical Association in the world. Others have existed for 50 years. The, the, the American one, the American Islamic Medical Association, Imana, has existed for nearly 50 years. We're far more active than they are. We have a bigger membership. We're able to do much more. And this is not me like trying to show off. I'm just trying to prove to you why that this works. We have Lifesavers events that's teaching, that, that's teaching people uh, CPR in masjids. And it went global last year. We teach health promotion at mosques. We're, we're help, we are virtually the healthcare arm of the Muslim Council of Britain. We're being referenced by SAGE. We're being invited by Public Health England to sit on their panels. We've created a, um, uh, a pathway for bare belly, uh, the elbow and hijab in theaters that's being used in Malaysia as well as here. We've, the amount of work that's being done in five years, if we, I literally spent a whole hour just talking about the amount of work that's been done. The people who've dedicated their time and their energy and their effort, that's what's possible. And you guys, are the most amazing part of this whole story because you are the future of this. SBIMA, the student wing, is always the most active of any organization because you guys are the ones who have the best ideas. You are the, you're, you're the younger ones. You have more time and energy and passion. You can achieve so much more. You are the future of BIMA. You're not only the future of the healthcare of the Muslim community in the UK, but I think worldwide, we're going to make a huge difference, inshallah. So I'm going to finish here. Brothers and sisters, this is the whole thing. The vision, right? If you want to build a successful organization, you need a base of a strong vision. And we have the strongest vision. And your ability to succeed and to make a difference and to make your time valuable and that you, you know, and to leave a sadaqa jariah that will last for a lifetime and after lifetime, inshallah, will depend extremely on how much you believe in that vision and you implement it. How much you understand it and you live it. 
then it's a team who believe and live in that vision. That's you guys, if you want it. But it comes with sacrifice. You have to sacrifice time and energy and your nafs. And finally, it's our projects. That's the final piece of the puzzle. If you do that, you build something that's strong, sustainable and stable like the pyramids. 3,000 years come and go, empires rise and fall, but the pyramid's still there. They're not going anywhere. But if you don't, then you'll build something like this, upside down. Start with the event first. The team doesn't believe in the, the, uh, the event or the, the vision, and there isn't even a vision to speak of. That pyramid will fall down before you even turn your back. Please spend your time and energy in Esbima in something that will be truly revolutionary, inshallah. Believe me, I said this a hundred times and I believe it in my heart. If you guys want to, if everyone in this webinar wanted to today, if you made the intention and you said that we are going to cut down the number of Muslims who smoke in this country by 10%, by the end of 2021, you could do it, inshallah. I believe you would do it. You've got the skills, the talent, the energy. You could do it if you work together. If you guys wanted to and you said, we're going to cut the number of Muslims who are diabetic by 100,000 before, before the end of the next three years, or if you decided that we're going to have a mental health advocate attached to every single masjid in this country, and in fact, we're going to grow it so that every mosque in the world has a mental health advocate. If you wanted to, you wanted to say that we're going to teach CPR in every mosque in the world on the same day so that the whole world knows that masjids are places where your lives are saved and your soul is saved, you could do it. All you need to do is unite first and then work like your life depended on, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, apologies for taking so much of your time. Please. Put your, uh, you know, take your time, think about it. The brothers and sisters who are already in Asbima, they've made their decision. They've done, you know, say, once you've made your decision, say, my Lord is Allah, and then be firm. That's all I we're asking for you. Take your time to make that decision. It's like a marriage. Uh, I'll finish with this last thing. The, the way you should treat your Islamic work is the way you treat um, if you're a guy, like a girl, you treat a girl. The way we treat it normally is like a girlfriend. Today, you're interested in medical work, so you do medical. Tomorrow, it'll be tafsir, then you go to that, then day after tomorrow, history, then charity, then this and that. And you'll be just roam around. Every time something gets busy, it gets hard. Wow, oh, man, there's loads of meetings in Esbima. Let's chip to Fosis. Man, this is, is this annual conference coming around is too busy. Let's chip to CW. Oh, let's, do, let's, let's keep chipping. Oh, I didn't like that person. I don't like their personality. Why are they in charge? Every time, just ditch and move, right? That's what people do with girlfriends all the time. I like a blonde today, but then she, uh, she's demanding too much. I'm going to go for the brunette. Then I'm going to go for the, uh, you know, the Belgian girl. I'm going to just keep changing around. Whenever anything gets difficult, just swap and change. But the way we should treat our Islamic work is like a wife. Think about it, take your time, research, pray a Sahara, and then work out which project will be the best fit for you. Not just the best fit while you're a student, but the best fit when you're a graduate as well. It'll also be the best fit when you're really busy, when you have exams, when you're married. What will be the thing that, you know, 10 years from now, when things are very different, that you'll still be happy to be part of this, that you think you can do some, you, you know, this is, this is what fits with your personality, it fits with your, your intentions and your interests and so on and so forth. That's a marriage. And then say, Bismillah. When you get married, what happens? The result of a marriage is children, a legacy that lives beyond you, that grows up and that gives you unconditional love. And every time you look at them, you're proud of them. And you can see that they're going to carry on your legacy, inshallah. When you have girlfriends, what do you have? Nothing. Bad memories and STDs. So, if you're going to choose Bima, think about it. Take your time. Pray istikhara. Research into it. But when you say yes, there's no 
don't turn back inshallah qalu rabbi nasi mustaqama jazakallahu khairan assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Jazakallah khair for that, Dr. Wajid. I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say that was super inspiring. And inshallah, I can't wait to see all the amazing things that we can achieve when we work together, inshallah. And just to like echo some of the points you said, just like, I don't know, earlier when I was like talking you through my own experience and issues I faced, like as a Muslim medical student, I'm sure every single person within this call uh, has their own unique experience and unique problems which they're facing. And I think one of the main take home points from this event and this, uh, this launch program is that we want to inculcate this, this vision into everyone that once we unite and once we buy into the values of SBEMA, of, of BEMA, that we can actually create a meaningful difference inshallah. And we actually have the means to do it, inshallah. Once we have the vision, we also want to give you guys some reassurance that we actually have the ability to do so. Because like the, the actual uh, system which SBIMA has uh, set out is quite unique uh, in the fact that we have MSAs. So we'll have medical student ambassadors at each medical school, which will inshallah help facilitate this unity and this bond uh, nationally and help facilitate the transfer of information and projects and of, of, of ideas inshallah uh, so just to give you guys a bit of a breather inshallah we're just going to break for five minutes uh, or maybe four minutes we'll reconvene at 8 15 inshallah so don't go don't go too far
Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you're all enjoying the event so far. And honestly, Subhan, I'm just reading the chat box and I'm just seeing like loads of just amazing suggestions. Apologies if I couldn't read them all out in time when Dr. Waji was creating his presentation. Uh, honestly, some amazing initiatives there. And uh, just to give you a bit of a taster of what S some of the initiatives SBEAM is going to get up to, I'm now going to invite Sister Sadia, uh, who is part, who is the SBEAM Regional Lead for London up, who will give us a bit of a glimpse into a very new, exciting initiative, which will be taking place in December, inshallah. So. Sadi, are you there? Okay, well, there's no sign of Sadia for the time being. So if she's not here, we can just uh, come back to her shortly in a minute or so. Uh, so as in, uh, uh, can we just skip forward two slides then? Inshallah, we'll invite Mahwish, who is our education, national education officer for this year who has been doing some amazing work on her own projects. And she's the, like the face behind the coping during COVID webinar, which you guys are probably all familiar with. So without further ado, I will hand over to Mahwish. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Mahwish. I'm a third year at Swansea. And as Zaid mentioned, I'm the education officer for the national team. Um, so I just wanted to introduce a little bit about what we're hoping to do. And again, the coping during COVID webinar. So. As part of the education team, we're aiming to equip Muslim healthcare students with resources to benefit them in their studies and their dean. So we want to try and use the platform that we've been blessed with to try and help address some of the issues that are unique to Muslim medical students and healthcare students and try and help create a sense of empowerment and unity. So that way we can address these issues together and reshape what it means to be a medical student or a healthcare student to allow our identities as Muslims and healthcare students to merge and maximize on both during our studies. So what we wanna do is we wanna to work together with the medical school societies and medical Muslim medics ambassadors that we mentioned earlier that are across the nation um, and share ideas from events that have worked well or things that would help healthcare students in toolkits so that's one of the things that we're working on at the moment with the MSAs. Um, so these toolkits include sharing event ideas, guides to hospitals and cities and where medical schools are based. And we're working on more things to incorporate on these. And we're hoping to get feedback from you guys as students on what would actually be helpful. So the other thing that we work on, as well as toolkits, is webinars. So we're trying to use them as a platform for Muslim healthcare students to be heard. We're hoping to encourage open discussions and get, again, empower students to do their best in their studies, spirituality and well-being. So leading on from this, our first webinar is this Saturday, inshallah, at 5 p.m. And it's designed to help us deal with studying during the time of COVID. So this includes some tips for preclinical pre students, um, such as working from home effectively, tips and also tips for clinical students like placements um, for experiences that we've had as a core team and also a little bit on exams and assessments. Our main focus, however, will be on mental well-being and mental health during this time. Um, because due to COVID, students in general are facing more isolation and challenges to their mental health than before, as you probably know. And as healthcare students, we have the unique challenge of uncertainties in our studies and anxieties around exposure to COVID um, as well as stressful things that we might see on placement. So we're hoping to speak honestly, openly about these issues and address them. And we're hoping to get our two guest speakers who've already been announced. So that will be Osama Ali, who's a fifth year medical student who has dealt with depression during his medical school career. And he's gonna be talking a bit about that. Um, and we have Sheikh Rafas, who's going to be giving a bit of an Islamic perspective on how to deal with difficult times. Ultimately, we're hoping to equip healthcare students with practical, practical advice and encourage use of our dean to guide us through these difficult times. Um, and we're also hoping to keep webinars running semi-regularly, semi inshallah, depending on the demand. And I'm keen to hear from as many of you as possible and get as many of you involved as possible. So please get in touch with your local Muslim medic societies 
and your medical school ambassadors. And I'll pass it back to Steve. Okay, Jazakallah khair for that, my uh, A lot of planning has gone into the Coping During COVID webinar. And honestly, it's going to be an amazing event, inshallah. So make sure you guys are all there at Saturday, 5 p.m. Inshallah, you guys should all be get emailed the actual Zoom link, I think, either tonight or tomorrow at the latest. But uh, uh, make sure you guys check your junk folders in case you miss out on that. Okay, I'm now just going to ask uh, Mahbuba to speak about the exciting upcoming initiative uh, which is titled Vitals. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, uh, Mafuba. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, so this program is going to be called Vitals and essentially what we want to do is deliver free workshops that relate to the BEMA vision and how we can take a proactive st stance as students, but importantly as Muslims. So the first session will be understanding and inspiring, understanding how our faith actually re relates to our work and what we can do to inform a change together. And then session two is build and unite, and session three is serve. I'm not gonna give too many details away, but we, we really want this to be an interactive workshop style, and it's not gonna be any like a talk series inshallah it will be different and we hope you you all find it beneficial inshallah um if anyone has any questions about bima in general uh, or s bima um please do drop them with the q a and we'll be happy to take questions in this last section Okay, Jazakallah khair for that, Mahbuba. Honestly, I'm really looking forward to this uh, vital uh, session as well. Honestly, I, I think it's going to be a really good one. A lot of thought and planning has gone into that as well. And more details to come out soon, inshallah. Make sure you guys keep your eyes peeled on the Beamer, like social medias, and also make sure you guys uh, familiarize yourself with who your MSA is for your institution and make sure you're getting all the latest news and stuff from them. But with that, uh, we'll start wrapping things up. Uh, that is the end of today's talk. Jazakumullah khairan everyone for attending. Uh, we hope you found this event engaging and inshallah, you now have a good understanding of what SBeamer is, how it came about, and some of the projects we have in store for you. Uh, please remember SBeamer in your du'as and I look forward to seeing you all at our future events and initiatives. But until then, that is all from me. Uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, we'll just uh, keep the call open just for a little longer in case anyone has any questions they want to drop in the Q&A sec uh, section. And if not, uh, on, or if you can't do it now, you can always uh, email us at students at britishema.org if you have anything you want to say. Uh, but that is all from us. Jazakum uh, Allah khairan for attending and assalamu alaikum.